In the story of Abraham and Sarah, whose names are changed partway through to Abraham and Sarah, we see an epic story of God's ongoing invitation to new adventures in living. As the excerpts you heard from the story show, God's inspiration and encouragement in their lives is not a one-time deal. The story as told in the Bible begins when Abram is 75 years old and Sarah is about 65. And God tells them to leave your country, your people, and the home of your parents and go to a place that I will show you. Yet we have to imagine that the story of God's relationship with Sarah and Abram doesn't begin there. Otherwise, why would they have packed up everything they own and headed out when God called to them? Generally speaking, people don't take big risks to follow the Spirit of God if they haven't already become attuned to listening for and responding to God in smaller matters. Big risks require big trust. And just like interpersonal relationships, our relationship with God grows in trust as we journey with God through life's ups and downs. So I'm pretty sure that Abraham and Sarah knew God before this. Otherwise, one would expect that they would have responded, are you kidding to me? I'm old, I'm not moving. Instead of, they pack up and move with everything they have to Canaan. Then some years pass and Abraham isn't sure that the move has been worth it. After all, he doesn't have any children and his heir is a slave in his house. So he talks to God again, and God promises that his descendants will be as numerous as the scars in the sky. Then more time passes, 24 years in fact since that first conversation. Hagar, his wife's slave, has a baby Ishmael, but Abraham still does not have any descendants by Sarah, his wife. He talks with God again, who renews the promise that Sarah will have a son even though Abraham and Sarah are really old now. And Abraham laughs. We more often read the story which comes a little later in the Bible, where visitors come and predict that within the year Sarah will have a baby, and Sarah laughs. But in this story, it's Abraham who laughs at the promise of God, which seems so utterly impossible. When we think about the ways in which God journeys with the community of faith, I think it's a lot like the ways God journeys with Abraham and Sarah. It includes inspiration to dare greatly, try new things, journey into unknown lands with courage. It includes encouragement when the way is just not like we imagined it was going to be. And we need to keep on being faithful through struggle and delay. It has room for doubt and despair, laughter at the impossibility of God, and hope. It's not a one moment, one conversation wonder, it's an ongoing relationship. And as we start our stewardship focus this year, we are considering what God might be inspiring us to do together as a community of faith. What is God doing in our midst, right here, right now? Former moderator George Cantwell talks about how powerful it is to share stories of inspiration in this short video that was made while she was still our moderator. Those of you who were at the conference worship service at the Canada Inns a few years ago may remember her saying something similar then. Hello friends, I wanted to share an observation with you, something that I've kind of noticed as I've been traveling around the church. Often, I think, as United Church folks, we tell ourselves a lot of kind of here's what's not working or here my budget is like in the red again or the roof needs fixing and we got a lot of kind of negative self-talk that we do but here's what happens when the moderator shows up at a congregation or a presbytery meeting or wherever all of a sudden people start pulling out the best stories. It's like, hey, here's what we're doing. We started a community garden. We did this neat ecumenical thing. We're doing all this amazing stuff. And here's what I've noticed. As people start to share those stories, everybody in the room is going, I didn't know all this was going on. This is really cool. Are we really doing all this? I feel so inspired. 
and they think it's the moderator that's inspiring them. That's not what's happening. People are inspired because they're telling the good news of what they're doing. So friends, I just want to encourage you to not wait for a moderator's visit to tell the stories of what you're doing because it's amazing. There's incredible stuff going on right across this church. And yeah, we've got broken roofs and we've got challenging budgets, but the gospel is very much alive in our communities of faith. And when we tell that story of where it's coming to life, our hearts are quickened and we find hope that allows us to deal with the roofs and the budgets and everything else. So folks, keep telling those stories. So fortunately, we no longer have a problem with the sanctuary roof since we replaced it last spring. But we do have budget challenges and struggles with volunteer energy and time, and all the usual ups and downs of being a congregation in these changing times. But today I want to invite us to take a moment together to tell the stories about the good things that are happening here. How are we living out the gospel? The narrative budget that you got with your stewardship thank you card shares some of that story of how we see God at work in our community of faith using three aspects of our ministry, open doors, open hearts, and open minds. So let's start with open doors. Did you know that more than 25 different community groups use space at Trinity in the past year? That's in addition to all of the church programs. And since we prepared the narrative budget, there are new things happening. We've agreed to hold a recovery worship service in later October, a group focused on philanthropy held workshops here in September. We will be a venue for an event with early childhood educators in November, and Big Brothers and Big Sisters inquired just this week about a space one evening a week for a, new, a program around post-secondary readiness. As affordable public spaces become more limited in this community and many others, the need for buildings like this one to serve the community and the church just keeps growing. Then we can look at open hearts. My guess is that very few people have any idea how many people connect with Trinity on a regular basis. People pop in or call or email the church to talk to Julie or I or Jackie. Our grief team volunteers connect with folks who have had a loss in their family or friends. Our UCW provides vital community to many women in the congregation and reaches out through funeral lunches, teas, and so much more. The place hummed with conversation just yesterday at the Saturday breakfast. Games Night has been providing an opportunity for fun and community for people with intellectual challenges for decades. And people we may never have met have been inspired by our social media stuff. Over the past few weeks, I have met with, five, with six different families on your behalf to talk about baptism for children, which will happen in two weeks' time. That's just a small sampling. Then we move on to open minds. Tonight is the second night of the ridiculous journey following a nobody from nowhere which has 12 adults engaging together in an exploration of what it means to follow Jesus every second Sunday this fall. And our Friday morning study group, which also has about a dozen participants, are looking at our faith journeys using Anne Lamott's book, Almost Everything, Notes on Hope. A retreat day looking at, about, looking at how we find God in the midst of our lives when they aren't going as planned is being scheduled for November. Our Sunday school is a busy, exciting place which offers faith formation and Christian community to children and youth. If you have never been part of our Sunday school program, you should sign up to teach because it's really exciting. And since you're here on Sunday morning, I hope that you find that the sermons and worship offer you something to ponder throughout the week on your faith journey as well. These are just a very few of the many ways in which I see God at work here at Trinity. If you are able to stay for refreshments after worship, I hope that around your tables, you will tell the stories the moderator invited us to tell. Those stories of how you see God at work doing good things here at Trinity. Because I look out and I see how many different aspects of our life and ministry different people here are involved in. 
To help us think a bit more about the impact of the ministry of this congregation, we're inviting members to give a Why I Give story as part of our stewardship campaign this year. And today, Hans Stasiuk is going to get us started with a few words. Uh, good morning, everybody. I kind of feel, after watching an inspirational message from our moderator, I kind of feel like uh, Jesus speaking after God because she was, she was great. I just can't say exactly what she said. But um, usually when I have to speak to either my mom or my wife that says, you know what, keep it short and be careful what you say. This time, I had a message from Mrs. Boychuk. She said, when you go up there, make sure you don't stay up there too long. So Mrs. Boychuk, I'm going <laughs> to try and listen to you and keep it short, okay? So why, why do I give? So when I was when I was growing up, my uh, my father and mother took me to church every Sunday. It was the, the thing to do. I never thought any different. And at Sunday morning, my dad would get the checkbook out. He'd get the offering envelope out. He'd write a check for the church. He'd get an envelope out for me. Put some money in that I would take to Sunday school to put in the offering basket. And that's sort of just the way it was. My dad volunteered at the church. He was on numerous church committees over the years. That's another way why, how he gave back. And I, I'd see how passionate my dad was. And anybody that knew my dad very well knew he was very, if you remember on a committee with him, you knew that he had his opinions and he spoke his mind and he really cared about the church. And he'd come home and he'd be mad sometimes because there'd be, and Julie knows this, <laughs> and Beth, because he'd, he'd share those stories. And, but it's because he cared about the church and about the people. My mom, uh, didn't participate in committees, but my, if someone from the church would phone my mom and ask her to bake something, my mom never said no. And to this day, she continues to bake on a, on a daily basis, and that's the way she gave back to the church. So my parents inspired me just by leading by example. They never had to actually say anything, they just let it go. Uh, times are different now because there are a lot more activities for our youth to do. So I don't volunteer at the church. I give back by, when Andrew was younger, I would help by coaching, and now I help, he goes to school in Winnipeg, and I'm on a few committees in Winnipeg at his school, and that's how I give back, and so that's why I don't have the time to really volunteer at the church. Once Andrew's uh, graduated from high school, uh, hopefully I can th then commit some time to the church. So I just think that volunteering is just as important as giving financially. So also I find like, we travel quite a bit and we go to Palm Springs at uh, spring break. We always go to church and I'm always giving a donation. I just don't even think twice about it. I just think it's, even though I'm not at Trinity, I'm still giving there. I, um, my parents were uh, married in Cape Breton and Marguerite Harbor Church. And whenever we're in Marguerite, we always go to that church. I was baptized there and same thing. It's just never an issue. We just, we just give. My mom and I, we don't even talk about what are you going to give. We just write a check out because it's, it's important to do that. And um, I saw when my, my dad was going through difficult times of his health, how important family and friends are, but also the church. And there's so many people that come to our church that were so helpful, and in particular, Julie and Beth. And until you've gone through a difficult time, you really don't know how valuable the church is. You know they're gonna be there, but it was just, it was just amazing. And so it's, it's just such a community, and that's another reason that we wanna give and, and support our church. We also want to support the church, not, not just, uh, we have to realize that there are lots of expenses the church have. The building, the, the salaries, traveling expenses, and so it's important. This is some of the things you don't always see. And on top of that, the church also has a mission and service fund. So we want to give so we can help other people throughout the world. And we want to become leaders in the world. So the church, churches used to be big leaders in the world for donating and doing what they, they could. Well, now there's a lot of charities. Anybody that watches TV, you'll see a lot of charities always trying to get to us to donate money. And so even locally, there's a lot, lot more charities than there used to be. And so you have to decide where you're gonna give all your money to. So the churches have less money these days because we're giving to other charities. And I'm not saying stop giving those charities, but we need to remember that churches can become leaders and our church can become a leader in, in the community and in the world if we just continue to, to give back. So I just urge everybody to continue to give generously, not just of your money, but also of your time. And I'm just grateful to be part of this community. I'm 54 years old and I've been here, grew up in Portage, been here all my life. And so anyways, hope everybody has a great day. 
Thank you for sharing your story, Hans. Being a Christian is not just about what we believe, it is our way of life. God has blessed us abundantly, and our response to this generosity is to care for God's world. This includes caring for ourselves, other people, and the world. Every action and decision, no matter how mundane, comes from this starting place of recognizing our sacred responsibility. We are God's children, and this leads to living with loving and generous intention. And in this community, we do this by patterning, patterning our life after Jesus. It's helpful to periodically take time to reflect on these blessings and intentionally share a portion of what we've been given. The act of setting aside a portion of our time or talent or treasure in response to God's generosity and for the good of others and creation cultivates within us a deeper, stronger faith. So for the next three weeks in particular, you will be invited to prayerfully consider how you support God's mission in this church and in the wider mission of the church and in the world, and to make appropriate and meaningful gifts of time, talent, and money. Take the time you need to make your intentions thoughtfully and in tune with God's spirit for you. In our giving, in our sharing, in our living, we are all part of God's love. Whatever our offerings, they are gratefully received.